everybody. Welcome to uh, class three with Lachelle, Swan, and Jenny. Uh, it's always fun to feel like we're connected, even though we're not in the same room. So glad for your interest. Uh, thanks for being part of Farm Table and our community here. Our mission is to build local food culture, as you all know by now, I reckon. Uh, we do that by supporting local farmers in our restaurant, through an art gallery, and through offering classes like this. And Lachelle and Swan and Jenny have, are all um, connected to that sort of mission in their own ways, in their own life. And it's been a real pleasure to have them. And I just want to acknowledge, too, that, you know, there's, there's a lot of work they put in behind the scenes on their own as a team. And uh, really appreciate all that you guys are doing to make this a meaningful experience for all of us. So thank you. And excited today to have Lachelle be our main instructor. Jenny and Swan are here, of course. And Lachelle uh, will be talking about American soul food healing. Um, and she can certainly introduce herself. She works at Good Acre and has uh, various ways she's involved with the local food scene and as a chef. So Lachelle, welcome. Jenny and Swan, welcome. Welcome to you all. Uh, take it away, Michelle. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jenny and, and Swan for being here with me again. And of course, thank all of you for being here with me today. Um, so yeah, we got a lot to do in this two hours. So we're going to get started right away. I hope you, oh, those of you that may be cooking, got the recipes. Um, and as you might have seen, I have a vegan collard green wrap, which we're going to actually do that second. And then we're going to start with the soup so we can get that going. Um, and what I did was basically created a formula for the soup. And so you were able to kind of pick and choose what vegetables you wanted to use, maybe two or three in each area. Um, and so I kind of on the fly picked my veggies too. Um, and so I'm going to do, uh, I actually found some purple broccolini at the co-op. So I got that. And then I got some cremini mushrooms. And I think that's going to be like the main flavors in my soup, maybe a little bit of the collard greens because um, we're eating those in the wrap too. So I might chop those up and put those in the soup too. So um, I were, I'm going to actually get started cutting so that um, I can talk and, and move through the recipe. Um, and also I have some slides to share with you guys as well. Um, but before I get into those slides um, and all of that stuff, I do wanna talk a little bit. First, I wanna know what you guys, if you guys have any questions off top. So if you do throw those in the chat, if you want to. Um, but I do wanna talk a little bit about why I picked this dish um, or these dishes. Um, and so let me just tell you about that. So. <laughs> I picked collard greens last time, right? You guys remember I did the, the collard greens. And so, you know, it's, it's a theme I'm carrying here. Um, and I think there was a question. Um, oh, I did an interview actually with Princess for Appetite for Change. Um, and, and, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm cutting the onion. And I know Jenny demonstrated this last time. So I'm just going to go ahead and cut it. But yes, thank you. Thank you. And just so you know, Lachelle, we have both your... Both your screens are highlighted so they can see your face and your chopping. Oh, awesome. Okay. Hey, that works. Um, yeah, so what was I saying? Oh, Jenny demonstrated how to cut the onion. That's what I'm doing. Keeping my hand, my fingers back, all that good knife safety, culinary skills, one-on-one -on -one stuff. So let me point that out. But <laughs> um, the reason that I picked this dish or that I keep carrying through the collard greens. And I was telling you about the interview I did with Princess from Appetite for Change. And um, so she was interviewing me about soul food, which is a topic I talk about a lot. Um, and she was asking me what was what would be the one dish that, you know, would be um, that I would relate to or that, you know, would always be at the family gatherings. And of course it was the collard greens. Oh, onions are working, my eyeballs. Um, hopefully I don't start bawling on camera. Um, but yeah, so collard greens always been a staple in my family. I think I talked a little bit more about that last time or the first time we met. Um, and just, you know, that connection I had with the dish. So I won't go into that, but that's, um, and so, you know, as a chef, I'm always like, well, what can I do differently with this ingredient? You know, sometimes it's like, you know, okay, collard greens. Yeah, that's great. I love eating them as a side. But like, what else can I do to make this exciting? So I cut up an entire onion. 
And <laughs> you may not put the entire onion in there if you're not an onion person, but I am. And I love um, onions. So I'm gonna put this entire onion. I think I got it cut up, kind of rough chop. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get this on the stove. Thank you, son. I have my teenager in the background being my support um, today. No other chefs in the kitchen today. All hey, right. Michelle. Say that. Hi, Le hello, Shell. Yeah. Just in case we have anybody new, I don't want them to miss out on the richness of your experience. And then also make sure that they um, know a little more background on like your interview and such, since I, I don't want anyone to have missed any of those important details about you. Okay, did we have some new people come in? Just in case. I... <laughs> well, there, there are people who weren't part of the first class. Some people. Oh, are, okay, okay, okay. Right. Gotcha. Not, some people aren't part of the whole gotcha. series. I get what you're saying. Yes. Okay. So, so basically, reiterate my connection to the to the to the collard greens and who you are too. I mean, that's all interesting stuff, and I don't mind hearing it more than once. I'm gonna get into that a little bit more. I just kind of, I'm just gonna explain the dish, and then yeah, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about me when I once I get to my PowerPoint. But in regards to the dish itself. And um, those of you that are on here that weren't here on the first couple of classes, I kind of forgot, like, yeah, that's a thing, you know, I appreciate that too. Um, yeah, so um, the interview with Princess, she asked me about the connection to the dish. Um, and ultimately, you know, we've been cooking this dish in my family for years. And, you know, it was always traditionally done with um, some sort of smoked meat. Usually we like to do it with smoked turkey because that was kind of like the healthier option. But, you know, traditionally in my family um, and in most, you know, African-American families are soul food uh, original, you know, dishes for um, collard greens was made with like a smoked ham hocks or, um, you know, something like that. And so we actually ended up, my mom ended up um, meeting a woman who taught her how to make it more simplistically. It was a, a Caribbean woman and she taught her and her um, ancestry was African. And so we kind of connected about that and she taught her how to make the dish without meat. And so that's why I ended up making and really connecting with the collard green dish. And so I, she really passed that down to me. And so I started really, I think kind of perfecting the dish in my eyes. <laughs> Um, and really, it's like five ingredients. So it's really about coaxing out flavor more than, you know, trying to do anything extra to it. So yeah, that is, um, that is really why I went to the collard green. And then why I get to the collard green wrap is because I wanted to think of something different to do with the collard green. Um, and I've seen collard green wraps before. And um, I kind of ended up kind of just doing it one day, just kind of putting stuff together in my kitchen because that's just what I do. And I had a collard green and I had some pesto and I was like, let's put this together. And so that's kind of how this collard green wrap um, was created. Um, in addition to that, when it comes to the soup, um, so just my personal connection is soup is like one of my favorite things to make. I love um, just like taking whatever's in my refrigerator, usually some leftovers or something and making a soup out of it. Um, it just is something therapeutic about the whole process of making the soup and then eating the soup. There's so much nutrition um, that I feel you get something about broth and, and soups. And so um, I have been kind of putting together this uh, meal plan for some of my clients. And a lot of people want like my help with thinking about recipes and what sort of, um, you know, what are they going to eat, especially people who are going plant based, um, or maybe people who have an ailment that they want healed. And so I did not mean to get rid of my onion shavings. I meant to put them in my stock. That was absent minded. I'm over here trying to make a, a stock as well. So all of my scraps, I'm going to put in there, I might end up cutting a piece off of an onion and putting it in there. So just so you know, I've got another pot of water. Actually, I can put it right here and you can see it. <laughs> and I'm gonna throw my scraps in there and make my stock um, for my soup as well. So where was I? Why I chose the soup. Yeah, so clients, 
um, are often looking for meal prep and things and um, advice on recipes. And so I've been putting together like these formulas where it's more about the, you know, what, what are the components of a, of a specific dish or recipe or, you know, idea from a smoothie to soups to different, you know, types of, um, I guess I didn't get the peel off of that one, different, you know, types of recipes. And so, all right, this is going a little hard. Now I'm gonna turn it down and stir it. Um, and so that's where I came up with the soup formula. So that's the story, the long winded story behind um, why I chose these two dishes, okay? So now I'm gonna probably move to this PowerPoint to talk a little bit about me and show you guys a couple of things. Um, and I'll go off and on for the PowerPoint as I'm cooking so you can see what I'm doing, which is right now I'm mincing up the garlic. And it is, um, I feel like Jenny's a little bit more of a pro at this than me like talking while you're cutting and trying to like remember what you're talking about and chop. Because I just like normally I would chop all the garlic down, but for some reason I left two cloves out. Like anyway, this is just the chef's thought about being efficient when you're. But Lachelle, your green nails are fabulous. <laughs> I do not have those. So. Very St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. So um, yeah, I went out with a friend and we did a spa day on Saturday and we went to the and got mani manicures and pedicures. And so, yeah, I got my little nails painted. Thank you, thank you. They're popping off the cutting board nicely. My little witchy nails, okay. It's very right. nice, very nice. Thank you, thank you. So I'm, um, I'm gonna leave that one out because I'm gonna actually put that one in here and this stuff in there. All right, so I'm, I'm cooking down my aromatics now. And the next thing on my recipe is that I'm gonna start putting in my hearty vegetables. I actually have an old, I have an old green pepper that was looking pretty gnarly in my fridge. That's perfect for a soup. So I'm going to put that in there and then I'm going to start putting in, I got mushrooms. So as I talk, I will be cutting the uh, pepper, the mushrooms and the broccoli while I talk. But in the meantime, let me jump on the PowerPoint and talk to you guys about that really quick for a couple of minutes. So uh oh, I gotta remember what I'm doing, how I share my screen here. There we go. There. So I have this PowerPoint, and I know I'm so efficient with the PowerPoint, but this is what I always do in my classes. I pop a PowerPoint up, or I have something, some sort of material. So I didn't wanna veer from my regularly scheduled program. So, you know, I, a little bit about me. Um, as Swan was saying, um, so this will get into that, but I have a business called the Healthy Roots Institute, Healthy Roots Institute, um, and ultimately what I do in there is focus on healing through food um, in multiple ways, what I call the love of food, the art of food, and the business of food, um, and so I do that through things like cooking workshops and retreats focused on uh, nutritional healing. I talk a lot about soul food history. Um, I talk a lot about um, social justice issues because that often comes out when you talk about history. Um, and so, um, and just nutritional healing, uh, a lot in, uh, I do a lot of plant-based cooking. I'm not a vegan per se, but I am very much plant-based, which means most of my meals are vegetables or mostly comprised of vegetables. Um, but don't get me wrong, I like ribs and sometimes I can't resist bacon. So, you know, but I try to keep it at a limit, you know, and try to keep it at good bacon, you know, like, uh, you know, locally uh, farmed and things like that, that we talked about before, um, Jenny has talked about in her class. So, um, but anyway, so I um, started teaching Actually, I started teaching through Minneapolis Community Ed, and I taught a class called, um, I created a class, this was when I was in culinary school, I created a class called Comfort Foods Around the World, and it really allowed me to explore 
really it was a way for me to learn and teach and I was actually able to make some money doing it so why not um and so but it was a way for me to delve into the cuisine of regional cuisine from around the world so I'm actually going to turn this down quite a bit because I want it to cook a little slower now I want it to burn with my garlic I'm going to add the um green peppers in now hey Michelle yep Jody has a question uh, do you throw everything into the stock pot I do all of the scraps. Um, certain vegetables I won't, like something that's a little bit too, like I probably wouldn't do like um, cauliflower, broccoli. Well, I might do broccoli. No, I really wouldn't do broccoli because they're too cruciferous and they make a, I mean, they make a very nutrient rich broth, but they'd be, the flavor would be kind of bitter and overpowering and that's not really what I'm looking for. But, you know, there may be times where I am looking for that and we'll talk about um, a little bit about what we call pot liquor um, a little bit later. But yes, I throw, I meant to throw my onion in there and I think I threw it in the compost. So I'm gonna actually just use part of this onion. And usually what I use is the tips that I cut off and then the um, skin. And then the garlic skins I put in there and all of the um, scraps from the green peppers or whatever peppers. Um, actually, I might get to chop in our vegetables for our um, other ingredients really quick and just do a bunch of veg prep so that I can get the other ingredients into the stock because I got some like red pepper here and I got some green onions for the pesto and whoop, don't run away for the pesto and the, um, the wrap here. So like these green onion tips, I can cut those off and put those in there. That's great for my stock. Um, and then I'm just gonna cut the, cut the outside off of this pepper so I can use that in the stock. So I'm just gonna put that in there. I'll say yeah, um, I'm gonna while you're doing that I'm just gonna answer Megan's question absolutely you can freeze scraps if you aren't making broth in fact I will often do that I will put all my scraps into just a bag in the freezer until I have enough and then make a big pot of scrap or stock and then you can actually freeze your stock too so I'll divide that into smaller portions so that I have you know multiple servings um, so yes, you can do that. And you can do that with uh, animal bones too, if you're making a, a, a bone stock or bone broth. Absolutely. And I'm pulling out some carrots because we'll be using those in the wrap. I'm gonna rinse them off really quick and then I'm just gonna peel them and I'm gonna throw the peels into my stock. So once I bring my stock up, I'm, I'm gonna add some more uh, water to that. But once I get it up, I'm only going to boil it for, I can let it simmer for, it doesn't really need to simmer that long. You can simmer for 10 minutes, 30 minutes. You don't really need to, you know, you can simmer it for a long time and get all of the juices out of that, um, out of your vegetables. And, you know, the longer you simmer it, the longer it's going to be, the stronger it's going to be. So, um, but for our purposes, we're probably not going to simmer it that long. So, Anyway, so back to what I was saying, Healthy Roots Institute, love of food, art of food, business of food. I do that through these cooking workshops. I also teach culinary arts education um, through my business, um, which is mostly focused on, um, you know, the art of it, right? The art of food, the, the culinary arts, as well as just, the, so that artistic expression piece, as well as um, professional development, right? So I do that. And as well as other, um, the other training I do is for food businesses, so entrepreneurs that are um, looking to start food businesses. I teach a class for those people as well. And I also um, do consulting and coaching with them. And so I do that with and in partnership with a couple of organizations. One is the Good Acre, which is actually, I'm employed by the Good Acre um, as the culinary education manager. And so they're um, I have a program related to farm to school. Um, and so I help train people to cook from scratch in school kitchens. Um, and so that's part of the culinary education piece. These carrots are kind of small. We'll see. Michelle? How this will be interesting when I go to. Um... Michelle? Yep. Excuse me. You're, you're up 
your uh, overview camera. Oh, it's back on. It turned off for a minute, but it's back on now. Oh. That's I could only see your your uh, picture, but not the image of what you're doing. But now it's back. Oh, maybe if it doesn't have anything in front of it, it goes. I don't know. Thank you. Something that was weird. Okay. Um. All right. So I've got my carrot parts. Let me just put some more water in here for a second. Give me just a sec, guys. All right, now I can really get to the business of building my soup now that I've got my stock on. Put a little more water, I want it to be full. One thing I'll just add that while Lachelle's moving around and this is really important and I think I talked about it last week and I know that Lachelle talked about it when she did her greens but building that flavor with those aromatics like she hasn't added her liquid yet she's just you know cooking those onions and that garlic and adding things to really really distribute the flavor and build the flavor before that liquid goes in so that's a really key thing about making soups and things that are going to be liquidy absolutely when we also had the conversation last week, well, it turned into a very long conversation specifically around salt, right? And a big part of that is tasting things as you go to make sure that you, you are building those flavors alongside your salt or your acid or um, those different aspects. So never be afraid to taste your food, right, Lachelle? <laughs> Absolutely. And another piece of that, thank you for bringing up salt because I haven't actually added salt. And I usually do add salt at this stage or even before this stage. Um, which I'm getting ready to do. Um, and so it is important to really season at um, all the stages in your cooking because then you, and just a little, right? So you're just adding a little bit of salt so that you're layering in the flavor so that by the time you get to the end, hopefully when we say season to taste, you don't have to add much salt at the end and you really allow that salt to develop in, in the cooking process as well. So that's another piece to it. My hand is wet. So I like to season with my hands when I use salt because I can feel like I have better control over it and can manage it. So my hand's wet right now. So I'm gonna wait a second, um, but I've got my mushrooms here and I've got my broccoli and I've got my stock going. And I think um, I did, I do have some canned, um, cannellini beans some they're organic but they are canned so i am going to throw those in here too for some extra protein i like to throw canned beans into things it's just convenient um and then if i do have time to make stuff from scratch i do use dried beans i took some out the other day but they didn't make it anywhere but back under the cupboard so sometimes it's just easier for me to grab the um grab the the canned beans Oop, don't leave me guy Lachelle, what would you recommend if someone's looking at canned uh, beans? You know how you can get it all kind, packed in all kinds of different. Yeah, liquids? I would definitely recommend like I shop at the co-op. So which is probably maybe more a little bit more pricier. Um, but you want to make sure it's BPA free. There's let me see my can here. So this says non GMO. Um, this is Eden. This is what I get from the co-op but it's got um, a BPA, BPS, um, and what is that other thing? See that? I can't <laughs> read that. You need your gla reading glasses. What I is it? Know. Hold it up to the, hold it up to the camera again. <laughs> it's another, and plus on my- BPA, eyes, BPS. Does that say gluten-free? No, the, the word right here, <laughs> but anyway it's probably a chemical we were looking for bpa bps non-gmo and of course it's gluten-free like everything without gluten is gluten-free but whatever to make, so bpa is the bisphenol it's a it's in hidden in plastics i just did a bunch of research on this um for a presentation and it's concerning the extent to which it's hidden in foods and so uh, again, I mean, I, I buy canned beans too, and I, I think they're a fantastic Thalates. resource. Thalates. Uh, yeah, phthalates. Um, phthalates, okay. It's, it's literally P-H-T-H, -H, like. Yeah, it's weird. It's weirdly spelled. 
But what I wanted to say is that another really good reason to just be really mindful whenever you're buying anything that is packaged to know what is in it. And, and if something doesn't say BPA free, or if it's in, you know, it's sort of a mystery to you, it might be an indication that they're that the producers don't know what's hidden in their packaging. And so just always kind of keep in mind that, um, again, as little packaged anything as possible is a great way around those things. But when we are buying things in containers, and of course we are, just to know what we're looking for and, and to be really, um, you know, an informed consumer. Absolutely. Yeah, and I would add to that the concept of just thinking about um, how stable is the container, right? Because plastics are flexible because they're less stable as a compound versus a can or um, a metal is going to have, is going to put off, um, I guess, less additives and et cetera, because just the substance is more stable. So when, when in doubt, um, you know, glass is the best, yeah. but yeah, you also, cans are also relatively safe. And then plastics are where we start to get into unknown territory. This is what I use for a lot. Like I have these cups around because as a chef, you end up having these cups around, <laughs> but I try not to use these as much for things like long-term storage. I might have them around for this and that, but I like to use like glass mason jars for a lot of my storage of just about leftover everything. I started just doing that more. Um, and that's, you know, there's all kinds of other, um, you know, uh, you know, non uh, plastic Tupperware containers and things out there. Um, but I, I like the mason jars because I use them a lot in my medicine making and um, I feel like they're a little cheaper. <laughs> I'll just say, um, you know, we're in my house right now, we're just in the process of trying to get rid of plastic and it is incredibly difficult. Everything, right? Your dish soap, your shampoo, your lotion, everything comes in plastic. And so just, it's a process and you know, we're, we're really stuck again in a food system, but really in all systems where um, cheap and convenient is what companies are going for. And so um, it's, it's work and I know that it's work, but I think it's really the, you know, the long, the long view is important. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah, it's choosing where to start too, right? So anything that's going to be warm or is produced warm, that's the focus on making sure that you, you know, try to get it in cans or in, in glass. And then once you feel like you have a handle on that, I feel like it, it lowers the bar and the, and the frustration that can often come with trying to totally remove plastic from, you know, how you get your food. <laughs> Yeah, I like the, and I always try to like reuse plastic and stuff. And I really like at the, I always keep bringing up the co-op, but at the co-op, they have biodegradable bags for their produce. So I take those and I reuse those as my compost bags, you know, so I'm, and then also at the co-op or even at your regular, whatever, most grocery stores, um, supermarkets have a bulk section where you can, you know, bring in your own container and fill it up and weigh just and I think there's a store I don't know if it lasted COVID but it was called Tear and that yeah, was basically it's still open. open is it still open I haven't but been that, over there yet but that's a really <clears throat> that's a good point in general I love um, the opportunity to buy things in bulk because it also gives you control over how much you buy and if you're trying something new and you're not sure or you don't have a lot of storage space or you know it's a great way to just explore ingredients. So buying bulk has a lot of different benefits. Hey, there's a question for you. Yes. Um, are there any combinations of vegetables that are just a, you should never ever combine in your soup? Um, gosh, that's a tough one. Um, I, I would say no, but I'm sure there's some, like I just got this vegetable that I still haven't, done anything yet with the langle. Ah. I did a piece of it and maybe I should put it in here. I don't know, but it was so strong. It tastes really medicinal, but that's how turmeric and it's a ginger turmeric related root 
rhizome. Classic Thai, um, Thai yeah. ingredient. So I haven't used this yet. Hmm. Let's, let's put it on the cutting board. So, um, so, uh, oh, it you know, like this stuff. things that are strong, you know, things with really potent flavors, how do they go together? But honestly, it's kind of like, um, I feel like that's the fun of cooking, making weird things combined together that maybe you wouldn't even think about, you know, but like, there are certain, like, um, there are certain properties that certain vegetables have. Was somebody saying something? I'm sorry. No. So like, for instance, artichoke. Artichoke has a sim chemical that actually changes the um, chemicals on your tongue for a limited time. And so it makes certain things taste bitter, more sweet or more bitter um, when you eat it with that. But you know, yeah, cilantro is like that it. too. Cilantro has a, a chemical in it that makes, for some people, it, it interacts with their saliva and makes things taste like soap. Right, exactly. But I would, I would agree with you, Lachelle. I think it's a great opportunity to just experiment. And, you know, the worst thing that can happen is that you won't like it. Um, there's nothing beyond, you know, there's nothing dangerous about it. And I say, right. trust your, your palate. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's also the reason why I really wanted to study regional cuisine, because then you can start to see like there's a history behind it, right? There's a geography to it. You start to see how people put ingredients together and what types of seasonings and spices are used for in, you know, Asian cuisine or I mean, you can say Asian cuisine, but Thai cuisine versus Japanese cuisine or versus, you know, um, Senegalese food versus uh, Liberian food, you know? And so, and how, and, and curries, different curries. You got curries from India, you got Caribbean curries, you got African curries, you got all of these. So just learning what those different like spice combinations traditionally, you know, that people use, I think is really inspiring. But also when you can think about doing fusion, when you can take, ah, that was my recipe that fell down. Oops, sorry. <laughs> the steam must be getting to it. Um, I don't need recipe, but um, anyways, um, yeah, so just thinking about the different cultural, um, you know, flavor combinations is where I started to learn about how to use different spices and different flavor combinations and different vegetables and how they, you know, and then once I got that foundation, then I started to explore and make different combinations. And that's where I started talking about talking about fusion and where um, you can, you know, take Asian in, you know, Asian ingredients and then make, uh, you know, a Latin dish, you know, make, you know, take Asian ingredients and make a taco, you know, um, and that's just a basic kind of idea. So I'm going to keep these greens. I'm actually going to just keep those together. I separated them, but they're all going to go. It's soup. I was doing my chef thing again. So anyway, <laughs> um, do I have any more questions before I move on? I put my mushrooms in. I haven't put the salt in yet because I wanted some of the moisture to come out of the mushrooms um, and maybe caramelize them a little bit. And so salt helps draw out the, um, the moisture but it will prevent some of the caramelization if it comes out too fast. So I'm trying to see if these onions can get a little bit more caramelization. Then I'm gonna add the salt. I'm gonna add the broccoli um, and I'm gonna add the greens. I got some collard green leaves here and I'm gonna add those in um, and kind of just let that stew down a little bit. Um, I also brought in some oregano from my garden because I wanted to add I don't usually add a lot of different spices to my soups. I like the vegetables I put in to shine through, but I have some um, oregano from my garden. So I'm actually going to put that in now. Michelle? Yeah? Um, would it be possible to see uh, your, some folks would like to see your cooking a bit more and maybe take oh, it off the, the PowerPoint? Box. I'm sorry. Yep. Take yep. Off the PowerPoint. Yeah, I meant to actually take that down for a second. Yep. You guys better there. I will put that back up in a second, but. I'm going to put some or in a little bit here. So, um, cause I got, I do have some things I want to show you, um, and talk more about, but do I have more questions? 
while I get ready to prepare a couple of these collard green leaves. Actually, this looks like a good one for the wrap. No questions at the moment, Michelle. Awesome. All right, so I'm gonna get these little leaves together. Um, and let me, I can talk about what's on my PowerPoint while you guys watch. So talking about collard greens actually um, was the next thing on there. And I like to break down, you know, what, in my classes, I used to actually break down every ingredient and tell you what all of the nutrients, that was a lot of work. So now I'm just gonna focus on one ingredient um, for now, which is these collard greens. And we're carrying them through in this soup. I'm doing what's called a chiffonade, which is when you roll a leaf up and then cut it thinly, slice it thinly. So that's how I'm gonna cut the collard greens for the soup. I feel like we need a little bit more than that because they're gonna cook down. So that was probably about four little leaves. I'm trying to keep the big leaves for the wraps. I also have kale in here, but we're gonna use that in the pesto in a second here. We're actually gonna start the pesto here once I get a little more greens going. But yeah, so greens are what's called a cruciferous vegetable, okay? Um, and it's, <laughs> there's a family, it's Latin, um, brassica, brassic, I can't pronounce it. It's on the slide. I went and even had the Latin That's little- correct. That's right. Brassica, well, but it, but it has another A-E-I, it has some extra syllables on the oh, end. Like the Latin pronunciation, but brassica is the family, you know, the um, the uh, species of plant, and that's all of these are related. The um, so it's related to cauliflower, broccoli, kale, you know, those cruciferous vegetables. They're brassica, um, is the family, and cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts. They all have that kind of stinky smell that sulfuric kind of smell to them when you cook them down. Um, and so, but they're super highly nutritious. Okay, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but collard greens specifically are usually, um, you know, they're eaten year round, but they're usually best during the cold temperatures. That's when a lot of people like them as, after the first frost, okay? Um, because they're more tender. They're actually also more tender when they're young. Um, so like these, I'm not gonna put the, um, the, uh, you know, I'm not gonna put this in my stock, the stems to the uh, collard greens because they're so, you know, they have that strong smell. But I would keep them if I wanted to make a pot liquor or something else separately to extract the um, vitamins out, you know, or I could put them in a smoothie or I could juice them and put them in like if I were in the juicing right now, which I haven't been doing lately, <laughs> but you know, just some other ideas so to, to eliminate the waste, right? So, but anyway, the other thing about that you got to know about greens is that they need to be cooked thoroughly. Oh, one more thing that I didn't add in yet. This is my favorite thing to add in at this point in the cooking. I always talk about tomatoes a lot because they have natural MSG. So do mushrooms. And so natural monosodium glutamate is actually a um, flavor enhancer. So the glutamate, that's what, um, you know, MSG has a bad rap, but <laughs> it's actually good in your food, especially if you can get it from natural things like tomatoes and mushrooms. That's why when you cook with tomatoes, it's always better the next day because that development of flavor happens um, with those tomatoes, okay? So I like to just, um ask once i'm to this point so i'm kind of cooking these on medium so you can see there's caramelization coming on here um and then i want to throw these tomatoes in and kind of cook those down for a second and then i'm going to add in these other veggies cook those down for a little bit further and then add in my stock and that's all going to get cooked down and then we're going to make a quick pesto and throw together our um do some shaved vegetables and then throw together our collard green wraps so the other thing about collard greens, 
It's been cultivated for over 2000 years around the world, right? Um, you know, stories say the Greeks um, in Greece, they've been, you know, cultivating it for a long time. Africa has been cultivating it for a long time. Um, so everywhere, okay? Um, all right, so I'm throwing the tomatoes in. Now I'm gonna put some salt in. And that's the thing when you keep cutting up vegetables, your hands wet the whole time. It's hard I'll to just, touch the salt. I'll <laughs> just comment too on the brassica family and especially the dark leafy greens. They are, and I, I'm pretty sure I talked about this every time I talk about food, but they are the best source of calcium. When you compare an eight ounce container of cooked collard greens to an eight ounce cup of milk, the calcium is, you get more calcium from the collard greens and it's more bioavailable. Um, especially if you're eating it with any kind of fat, which helps you access that, that I, and there's iron and there's vitamin K. So they're just power packed bone health. And um, we should really just remember how much we can get out of eating food for our health. Well, yeah. And to even build on that, um, people often think about calcium for bone health but there's been a, um, quite a few studies uh, around the best way to actually get the calcium into your bones is by, is by consuming it with other nutrients. And the easiest way to get the appropriate amount of nutrients is by eating whole foods. Um, so there's uh, concerns around if you have excess, if people consume excess calcium supplements, that it can actually contribute to the hardening um, of arteries. But when consumed with fat soluble vitamins like K2 um, and magnesium, your body can actually turn that into um, stronger bones. And then what's even cooler is when you have excess, it literally detoxifies your body. So we talk about these natural detoxifying supplements. Um, and one of the coolest side effects, I think, is actually balancing your hormones in your blood. So um, cruciferous vegetables function as an estrogen, like an excess estrogen cleaner, uh, like goes through your blood and actually rebalances um, a lot of your, uh, your, um, core, your core hormones. So if you're looking to basically just feel better, the darker the green, the vegetable, um, the more likely it is to actually support everything that Jenny is talking about. And even some of those more, um, I guess, like physical, like um, aspirations, like weight loss um, and, and better skin and just be feeling better hydrated and better energy. So if you needed excuses, if you ever need excuses to eat vegetables, you can just talk to the three of us. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely. And here, I actually will really quick here, since this opening up can uh, beans isn't that sexy. Let me show you this slide, um, which is the nutritional healing part. So this is what's in just the collard greens. We're not even talking about the onions, the garlic, the mushrooms, the peppers, the onions that I put in here. And I use grapeseed oil, um, which has nutrition to it. And it's a high heat oil, it's neutral. Um, and so, and we're not cooking this at a really high temperature. So. Um, so, but in the, the greens themselves, right, we've got, and this isn't even like cooked greens. This is just, we're talking about raw collard greens when we talk about, you know, the vitamins and the minerals that are in there and they already, they're like 80% water, right? Which is like us, right? So, um, you know, they've got like, uh, so I said tons of vitamins. They are tons of vitamin K which is really good. I mean, it's got like way more than three days worth of vitamin K in there technically. Now, again, are you absorbing that? Are you uptaking that, you know, properly with a balanced diet? You know, all of these vitamins, that's why they all come into play. That's where the balance comes in, right? Vitamin A, vitamin C, these are just the ones that have the higher percentages in the vegetable, um, tons of minerals. So I'm kind of telling you here, what those vitamins and minerals are doing, kind of more general, right? Manganese, antioxidant, antioxidant inflammation, blood sugar, right? It's helping with those things, but it, there's, there's, um, there's more, right? So that's also a thing that I'm learning when I'm, the more I'm getting into plant medicine is I'm gonna go ahead and add the greens to this. The more I'm getting 
Oh, what was that? I was just going to add, um, so the cooking part is really critical with the accessing all those nutrients. And one awesome, I know you're good, you've talked about pot liquor and you're going to talk more about it, but one of the reasons it's so great is because all of those nutrients are hanging out in that, in that liquid that you're cooking your greens in and the cooking of the greens makes them accessible. So it's all sort of this beautiful stew of nutrition. Exactly. Absolutely. So now we're doing a raw collard green application, which has a different benefit, right? You're getting lots of uh, chlorophyll and you're getting the fiber and, and it's a different, so your, your, your body is able to uptake the, some vitamins differently. And then when you get it in the cooked version, it's now converting, right? And so, um, and Jenny probably knows way more about that than I do. And can, can you talk to us a little bit more about that? No, that, no, I thought that's totally right. So raw and, and cooked versions of vegetables do have different functions of the fiber is, is a great example that I, and I love that chlorophyll and also just, um, at different times of the year, our bodies need them in different forms. So right now, as we're emerging into spring, starting to eat a little bit more of the raw greens is going to be really important because it's cleansing too. So Absolutely. All of that, that cleansing, that chlorophyll is technically a blood cleaner. And then technically like chlorophyll is like to plants what blood is to our body. And so it, and it's actually taking, you know, the photosynthesis is taking the energy, you know, those nutrients from the sun photosynthesizing. And then, you know, that is now being uptaken from, and there's a whole nother, you know, matter about the air and the soil and the water and how clean it was and all those things come into play. But um, ultimately you're getting a lot from micronutrients, right? We're not even talking about these ones that are on the screen here. So I'll stop. Oh, and just before I stop sharing the other thing um, I was just talking about, I went over collard greens, a couple of other things, just as far as how they relate to soul food, right? So they're a staple of, I'm actually checking out this galangal again to see if it might be, oh my goodness. Whoa, no. Mm -mm. We don't know yet. <laughs> don't get <me> wrong. <laughs> it's like floral and spicy and medicinal. Like Thai, Thai food. Woo! Let me just, well, I'm, I'm curious now. Thing. Whatever I might have had, I'm cured. <laughs> one other thing I would add to, um, to really pay attention when it comes to like, to different forms or different cooking, um, in order to get fat soluble vitamins into your body efficiently, it's important to pair healthy fats with your vegetables. And the cooking process does help unlock some of those heavier fat soluble vitamins in an effective way. So the most, the easiest way or how I memorized the fat soluble vitamins in college was Cade, K, A, D, and E. Those are the four vegetables that um, do function better, in, especially like when it comes to absorbing them into your system um, by pairing them with a fat. So whether if you're in a raw form, having a healthy fat um, dressing, right? Like a salad dressing, that's really helpful when you're cooking, you know, there's very obviously like not being afraid of using healthy fats. So I know we went on a rant about fats um, during the last class. So if you haven't if you didn't see that one, um, I definitely recommend checking it out. We talked a lot about fat and salt and how, as long as you pick good sources, um, you will be better for it and your taste buds will be happier too. <laughs> and you know, even, even if you're taking a calcium supplement, which of course, none of us are medical professionals and won't, won't um, prescribe them. But even when you're taking a supplement, if you don't take that with fat, you won't access the calcium. So that's how incredibly important that relationship is. Absolutely. And to that, with both of these recipes, we've got, so when, whenever I'm making a vegetable soup, you see, we started with that uh, grapeseed oil at the beginning, but when this soup is done and we're ready to finish season to taste, we're going to put more, more Olive, I like to put extra virgin olive oil in the soup to finish, especially a really vegetable-y soup because um, it is for the purposes of what these two lovely ladies mentioned, but it's also about um, the actual mouthfeel and the unctuousness of how appetizing it is when you eat it. If it's just like watery, 
it's not going to be as appealing. So that wa that oil is going to help. And the same thing is doing in your mouth is the same thing is doing in your for the nutrient piece and the lubrication and all of how it's it's basically a conduit, right? Oil is a conduit. We use it in medicine making to extract uh, the actual medicine into the oils, right? Um, so there's it's very um, interesting and, and complicated and fun to learn more about. I actually did cut up some more mushrooms because I cooked those mushrooms down so far that they're like disappeared. So I'm putting some more in now right before I, I'm just gonna cook them for just a couple of seconds till they get, uh, you know, uh, start um, releasing the moisture. Then I'm Michelle? gonna go and pour my broth over. Questions? Yeah, would it be possible to see your what you're cooking a little better again? Oh, I'm sorry. I meant to take that down. Okay, before I do that, before I do that, I won't do anything else. I just want to say this so I can move on from this slide, which is the soul food piece of collard greens, right? We talked about them being cooked with the meat, but I wanted to talk about that tradition piece and that pot liquor piece. Um, so the tradition with collard greens, stewed collard greens, the ones I made in our first um, when we first met, that tradition is really comes from an old custom, and you can call it superstition, um, cut, you know, custom. I, I like to just, you know, call it a part of my practice, which I do it every year, which is make collard greens on New Year's Day. I make collard greens and black eyed peas and cornbread, and this is an old tradition. Um, oops, I turned off the wrong burner. <laughs> this is an older tradition. I'm going to pour my um, stock over. Now, because I didn't cook this very long and I need to go ahead and use it, I could add more water to these veggies and continue to cook this, cook the um, nutrients out of those vegetables and make another. And I could add more scraps to that as we're going. So I filled my pot up about halfway. I'm just going to, and this is pretty liquidy. I didn't put a ton of vegetables, different vegetables in here because I wanted to keep it simple, um, but I am going to add the beans. But right now I'm basically just going to bring this up to the boil and then turn it down to simmer and just kind of let it cook for a little bit while we get to making our pesto. Any questions in the meantime? Awesome. So yeah, that pot liquor is an amazing broth. You know, a lot of people nowadays, it's like the bone broth of, of, of greens, right? Everybody's eating, take, doing bone broth. It's full of nutrients and it's, you're cooking down those bones. I don't know how many of you have heard or know about bone broth, but you guys want to talk about bone broth for a second while I set my um, pesto making situation up here? Well, there's a couple of questions that just came in too. Okay, sure. Um, well, actually, Jenny, I feel like this is one, the first one from Linda G um, loops back on what you were saying earlier about the difference between raw and cooked vegetables. Um, raw smoothie of same ingredients versus cooks. So that's a really good question. So here's my the question, Jenny, um, just oh, in case people is, haven't read it. Is there more nutrition in a raw smoothie of the same ingredients versus cooked soup or not? Is there any loss of nutrients in the cooking process? Really good question. Um, gosh, I get this question all the time. People are really into smoothies. And what I generally would like to say is I encourage people to eat their nutrients rather than drink them in general. If you have, you know, if you have no choice, throwing stuff in a smoothie for whatever reason from time to time is just fine. Um, and also what we, how we eat our food and how cooked or not it is, has a lot to do with where we live and what's available and what makes sense for us at different times of the year. So for us in Minnesota, in this northern cold climate, it doesn't make sense to eat a lot of, you know, cold salads in January. It makes a lot more sense nutritionally in terms of our digestive heat. And, and you know, in Chinese medicine, they talk a lot about heat and generating heat inside your body. So um, it makes sense to eat warmer foods when it's cold and colder foods when it's warm. It's what our body needs. We need to do the work and create that heat inside. Um, I think in general, cooking food is helpful for processing and breaking it down. Um, there's a place for raw food, but I'm not a, a believer that, I mean, what I would say is 
if you can keep the liquid that you cook your food in, you're going to capture all those nutrients. So as much as possible, don't lose the liquid that you cook foods in. And I'm a big fan of using fat to access nutrients as a cooking vehicle and a, a vehicle for heat. Um, so that's, I guess, what I would say about that. And just, I'm just seeing this green carrot tops, totally great for pesto. I use them, I use them regularly. Oops, I'm putting some oil in our soup now as it simmers, just to kind of- And Jody has a question about bouillon or some concentrated soup. And that's actually a perfect segue back into what Lachelle was talking about with bone broth. Um, so uh, what I'll say about bone broth, actually I made some last week. Uh, it's about making sure it's a good flavor and also making sure that your bones are a healthy, we're a healthy animal to start with. Uh, so the healthier the animal, the more nutrients are packed into the marrow of their bones, um, because that is a storage place for us. So part of the reason why when you're a malnourished human, uh, why brittle bones become a problem is because your body is literally pulling nutrients out of storage in order to keep you alive and to keep your cells functioning. So the, the more nutrients you pack into your body, the healthier your bones are, the more nutritious the marrow is. So in the same way that if you have a bone from a unhealthy animal or one that was abused essentially, which unfortunately much of our food system abuses our animals, you're gonna end up with unhealthy broth. So like tying that by, back into bouillon or concentrate, if it's a really good bone broth, it will be gelatinous, which will be almost exactly like a bouillon, but healthier. And for that point, I'm just going to pass it off to Jenny because I can see her just like chomping at the bit to jump in on this. <laughs> no, I'm just enjoying listening to you. I'm nodding vehemently. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's true. And I guess the other thing I would say about bullion is, you know, again, like I, we camp a lot. And so bullion is something that we'll bring with us in that situation, but make sure you know what's in that bullion. Cause that's just a, like often a really big vehicle for salt and other added things that you don't want hidden in there. Um, so any chance that you have to kind of make your own concentrates or, you know, and as I mentioned, cooking stock down you can cook stock down to such a degree that it really is pretty concentrated um so i would just be really mindful of what's in whatever you're using and just i i think this whole it's fun how these conversations go because that whole bone broth conversation is tied to this idea of calcium right because um the calcium that's in a healthy bones then leaches into that bone broth, which then is a much better, more accessible way for us to get calcium than, for example, drinking it in milk. <laughs> so there's this really wonderful way that these things all kind of interrelate to each other. And it's packed with fat because it's the bones have, are right next to fat. So a lot of the time you'll get some meat on those soup bones. Um, so we were talking about like trying to combine all of these things together to make sure you get the right nutrients. Well, have a delicious soup. Um, and then find basically like cooked down bone broth ends up being almost exactly like bouillon. Um, and there are some like al alternate options. So like, I've, I think I've mentioned my love of Costco. So they sell better than bouillon. Um, while there are additives in it, it's, on the healthier end of the spectrum if you're going to choose something that is like quick um, to help you at least get into the habit of um, being able to cook foods quickly. And I'll talk um, a little bit about that during my class too. But yeah, there, there are options out there that are on the healthier end of the spectrum. But like what Jenny was saying, whole foods are always the best. Um, I'm sure Lachelle, you have lots to contribute to the bone broth conversation. Absolutely. Well, I was, yeah, <laughs> I made some bone broth recently. It was great. We drank it. Um, and then I ended up making French onion soup with it. And that was really awesome. So, um, but ultimately now, you know, we were talking about stocks, right? So we made a stock from the um, veggies right? And you can make a bone stock as well. So what makes it broth is if you're putting meat in there and then your, um, so broth is made from meat and bones. Stock is usually made from like scraps or just the bones. And you can roast the bones or leave the bones um, uncooked 
Um, and so that's where you get into light and dark stocks. And then if you change the meats, there's a, there's a lot to know there, but um, ultimately just knowing stock is, is there's no meat involved. It's just the bones or just the scraps. And then the broth is meat and bones. And then once you, um, then broth becomes soup. Once you leave the meat and any vegetables in there, then that's when, so that's when you get to the soup piece or stock, right? So, um, so yeah, that's, that's that. I am getting on though on the next recipe. So I want, I don't want to um, leave you guys out of the fun. Uh, I'm going to turn the soup way down now because I'm going to just let it, oh, I'm going to actually add my beans to it. So I drained my beans and I'm just going to put them in here. Um, there. Stir those in and I'm going to let that, I got that on low. I'm going to just let that kind of come back up to the heat back up with the beans in there looking good you can see the little oil um i hope maybe you can see the oil that's on the top that's great i like that um it looks like there's definitely enough oil so i don't need any more um but it's gonna be great when when we eat that so now on to the pesto and the wraps let's get to this we're right halfway through class so or we're what we got a half an hour left so we gotta hurry up and get this pesto done in this wrap this will be fast so I've been doing this collard green wrap for years and I was like, how am I going to make this cooler than it was, which is already cool enough, but how do I <laughs> kind of really, you know, nail home that soul food theme? Um, and so I started thinking about these ingredients and, you know, what makes it soul food. And of course, I love to celebrate, you know, all these different influences in soul food. There's indigenous influences there's African influences, well, for African slaves, right? But they definitely had a lot of influence from native um, and indigenous uh, people that they, um, you know, intermingled with. And um, as well as all, you know, America being the melting pot that it is, I like to think of soul food really as the melting pot food because so much of the cuisine is really about different cultures coming together. Um, so that's what really soul food is about. If you think about um, so food from like Louisiana, Cajun and Creole, that's like mixtures of French and African and native again, right? So, and then when you think about, and you know, I won't bring up any more slides, but um, we really, I really get into like what that progression is and and where soul food started and how, where it is now, you know, um, and all those different influencers. So that's how I got into switching up the ingredients. Normally pesto paste, right? Um, and it's usually traditionally made, you know, with just like garlic and herbs and olive oil and maybe some lemon juice, salt and pepper, right? Um, and then they add in usually traditionally pine nuts, right? So you're getting some protein there. I've always switched up this recipe and like did what I call a garden pesto where I mix together different herbs. So whatever herbs I have, cilantro, parsley, I bought green onions, um, basil, you know, that's traditionally what it's in it. But then I wanted to kind of, you know, add some more flair to it. So I, you know, you can really do it with anything green, right? So I was thinking turnip greens, mustard greens to make it more Southern soul. They didn't have that at the grocery store. So I had to go with at the co-op, which I love, but at the regular grocery store at Cub or wherever else they probably do. But anyway, so I did kale, I did a little shard and I did um, cilantro, basil and green onions in here. I didn't put any um, collard greens because I figured we had enough of that. And then I wanted to add, usually instead of, I don't like pine nuts because I think they're bitter tasting and I have a really strong sense of taste. So I use um, sunflower seeds and I love, um, you know, I think it's a little nod, an, an, an indigenous nod, the sunflower, right? And so I add sunflower seeds and then I wanted to add pecans because I felt like that was represents the South and Southern, you know, pecan pie and things like that. So I am switching out the nuts to be um, pecans and sunflower seeds together. And I just feel like the flavors, once this all comes together, is really gonna be great. What's so, really nice too about the sunflower seeds is they're, um, for anyone who's got a nut 
issue or a sensitivity, they work really well and they're much, much more affordable than pine nuts. Absolutely. That's, that's the part I don't like about pine nuts. <laughs> yeah. They're very expensive and um, and these have a similar oiliness and a uh, really great flavor. So great option. Absolutely. And so if you do have a nut allergy to like pecans, you just use, replace the pecans with sunflower seeds. Also um, uh, pumpkin seeds work really good too. They have a really great flavor to them. Um, so this has the garlic also, um, which I'm doing. So I like to just put it all in my blender, which I'm trying to do here for us. Lachelle, there's a question of whether or not you recommend raw or roasted nuts. Um, I always start with raw nuts as much as I possibly can, but if you, you know, it depends on the flavor. Roast is gonna give you a nice flavor. You know, you're gonna get that caramelized flavor. So for flavor rot wise, I would recommend roasted, but for nutrient rot wise, raw nuts are gonna often be better because you're in, you end up, you know, kind of um, changing the, and again, Jenny and Swan probably know more about this, but changing <laughs> the, um, when you start. Um, um, the chemistry. Yeah, you start changing. <clears throat> And so. The one thing about roasting, uh, toasting nuts is that you you kind of release the oil so they break down and get creamy, which is just a texture thing that's kind of nice. Like if you want to make your own nut butter, it's yep. easier to do that with toasted nuts. Exactly. And the flavor. So that's releasing. So that's adding to the, that's really like adding to the aroma, right? That the, the that development, right? The, the smells come in there as well. So the other thing that usually is in pesto is um, some sort of aged cheese like Parmesan, um, but where I do this, a, a vegan version of this. So I actually use nutritional yeast. Um, and who wants to talk about nutritional yeast while I hurry up and get the rest of these ingredients in there? You guys um, wanna talk about what it is? I believe it, it's the yeast that grows on beets and it's not active. So it's not like you can, um, you're not going to, you know, use this for making bread. It's, it's really a nutritional um, aspect. But what do you know about it, guys? Uh, well, it is a, it's a cultivated yeast, but it's um, what's great about it is that it has, it's a source of vitamin B12. So for folks who are not consuming animal proteins, which is the only natural source of vitamin B12, except for nutritional yeast, you, you have an option and it is, I love it when, you know, we eat it like on toast with butter or on popcorn. Um, so it's, it's got a sort of cheesy texture and flavor to it. So it's a great alternative. And then it's just really got, it's just this great source of B12, which is really important. Um, and it's just <laughs> A good way to get it. I mean, you can get it in combinations of other other things, but it's a really super solid, um, dense source. So the other thing I decided to add into my pesto to, you know, get some soul in there is I'm going to put some harissa, which is a Moroccan red pepper, um, basically a sauce. It, this one is spicy. They're not all spicy. Um, I'm going to throw some of this in there. And I'm also thinking about sambal, which is a garlic, um, a garlic pepper paste that's um, Southeast Asian, but uh, we'll see how it goes. So I have never added a spice to this pesto. Um, so now I have all my ingredients in my blender. I'm going to go ahead and um, get some oil in because <laughs> I can't, the, this blender doesn't like uh, stuff like this if there's not some liquid going on in the bottom. And of course this can, gotta be graceful here. And also, I, you know, I'm not measuring anything, but the measurements are on the, the recipe if you do need them. <laughs> I'm just going with it. So I'm gonna get this going. I've been looking at ways to reduce dairy in my life. Um, and I love the taste of cheese, but my skin does not love cheese. My, like my, my, um, my sinuses don't like cheese. 
So how do I get that same type of umami? And a lot of the, if you look it up, like paleo recipes for like macaroni or like um, the cauliflower mac and cheese that actually tastes good has nutritional yeast in it. So I've actually just started experimenting with different recipes and trying to figure out the flavor profiles that are effective for me. But then here, like some of the things I've learned about nutritional yeast is actually complete protein. It has a lot of those trace nutrients in it that other, um, that other foods just don't. And like Lachelle said, it's, it's not a live yeast, it's actually dead. Um, I actually have some yeast sensitivities. So like brewer's yeast is the worst for me. It gives me terrible headaches. I found out that that's the reason that beer basically like knocks me out. <laughs> Um, so I just don't drink it, can't drink it. Um, and, uh, so I'm, you know, I'm testing sensitivities and seeing how my body responds to it. Like we were, we've talked about in previous classes, the best way to figure out if you like something or if your body likes something is to actually try it or try your life without it. Right. So fast with it or, um, or test it and see, see how you do with it. Um, and I think that's that's the most important aspect to some of these newer ingredients that a lot of us, I think, just haven't really tried before a lot of these movements around paleo and keto and um, trying to eat cleaner. Doesn't mean that everything's gonna be right for you. Not everybody has gluten intolerance, just like not everybody um, has a dairy intolerance, but it's important to make sure that your sources are good uh, regardless of, of what you're uh, including. Yes, and this is delicious, okay? So I had not tried it with these other greens and the pecans before. I'm like, is there chicken in there? No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but that um, nutritional yeast and the pecan, I don't know, something different is happening. So now I'm gonna put some harissa in here. Ooh, I kind of put a lot. I put two tablespoons-ish. So let's see what this comes out like. So you're just experimenting with me, guys. I'm gonna mute again, so keep, talking <laughs> Jenny Jenny we have to hold down the fort while she blends well I did want to you you made an important distinction between brewer's yeast and nutritional yeast and when I was first eating nutritional yeast a lot of people in my world called it brewer's yeast and I thought it was one and the same thing but they're different and so nutritional yeast is what we're talking about and it's that sort of yellow flaky powder and um it's I think it's really uh, an appealing flavor, but just know that there's a distinction between those two things. I think Swan is going to get her nutritional yeast to show it to you. Yeah, yeah. so if you, if you uh, can see, so Swan, S-U-A-N, you'll find me somewhere in the panel of a bajillion things, but this is the most common brand you'll find in a lot of stores, uh, Bragg. Um, so if you're, if you're trying to look around for some standard nutritional yeast, also like they sell it on Amazon cause it's dry. So you don't have to put it in your fridge or anything like that. Cause it's, you know, it's dead. So it's not like other yeast that you have to, um, you have to preserve, right. Make sure it doesn't die it in, um, you can buy it in bulk at the co-op, I think too. Yeah. Yep. Um, and you can, it's like the conversation buy yourself a glass container and slowly move over from plastic. <laughs> so it all loops together. We're all doing the best we can. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. <laughs> oh yeah, it's a process. Yeah, like I switched over to all glass um, Tupperware containers in my home. Um, so I wouldn't have the temptation um, of, of reheating things um, in plastic. Even when I get my meal plan service, which does pack like my meals in plastic, um, I will take them out of that and then reheat them in, I have a oven safe or like a toaster oven safe dishes now. So again, it's another, like, I don't have to think about it. I just put it in my oven safe dish, throw it in my toaster oven. And then that's how I reheat my food to preserve nutrition. Um, and then also to make sure that I'm limiting how much I'm heating plastic alongside my food. So a lot of the time it's finding ways to make it easy on yourself instead of trying to learn a new habit, just replace within your normal habits, um, something healthier. Totally, totally agree with that. Okay, I'm gonna just taste my soup and see if it needs any seasoning. And then we're just gonna build this collard green wrap. I'm just gonna build one really quickly right in front of you. But that's, ooh, it needs salt. <laughs> 
I only think I put a, maybe like a teaspoon of salt in there. So I think it honestly needs all of this salt that's in there, which was probably about two teaspoons. Well, fun fact, or I think this is something that everybody is acutely aware of. It's very hard to remove salt from soup. But sometimes if it's just a little bit too salty, a potato can absorb some of the salt out of the liquid. So just uh, one of those tips, like we were talking also about like, what do you do if something is too spicy? Well, at least when something's a little bit too salty, a potato can save your life. Um, if it's way too salty, it, you might just have to water it down or start over, unfortunately. So it is good to add as you go. Add as you go. I try to only add, and I know how to, me I know what a teaspoon looks like because I've measured it in my hand so many times. That's why I like to season with my hands. I also know what it looks like because I've measured it so many times. So you want to get used to, you know, adding like a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon at a time. Something like this soup broth where I know it's like mostly water. I'm going to add more salt to it to get the flavor I want, but and, and the quality of salt will definitely change the flavor profiles too, as we've talked about in the past. So, Lachelle, uh, you want to show your packet of real salt just for all the newbies? <laughs> and so where is it? Yeah, it's right here. So this is the real salt I use, full of minerals. It's pink. Um, and Swan knows all of the, you talked about this before, but you want to tell them a little bit more about that salt in particular? Well, yes. before you do, let me say what I'm doing okay. now. So I'm getting ready to roll one of our collard green wraps. Um, now, I like to leave it raw because it's a raw collard green wrap. I call it raw sole. Um, you can blanch these leaves, um, which some people do, but then it's not raw anymore. But if, if it's a little bit too hard, like I like the crunch of it. I And some people think in their head that it's gonna be too rough, but when they actually get the collard green wrap, they're like, oh, okay because it's, it's very durable and we're using it as the wrap, right? So we want it to have that texture. But what I also do is I will go across um, and I'll turn it out. So, you know, the flat part of the leaf here, and then there's kind of like the stem that's sticking up on the outer side of the leaf. I like to go with my knife and cut that, uh, shave that down. So then it makes it, you know, so that that thick stem isn't there. And you got to be careful not to tear up the leaf while you're doing this, but <laughs> probably could use a paring knife better. You but need a that sharp will... knife too, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, but a smaller knife will help you have more control if you use a paring knife. But anyway, that's going to help so you don't have that thick stem when you're trying, that's just not what we're looking for. So I'm going to go ahead and put, and now this, this <laughs> does take quite a bit of pesto to make this wrap delicious. So don't be shy. It's a generous serving of all those delicious uh, nuts and uh, herbs that we put in there, okay? And oil. So okay, I, fats. Good fat. So I just <laughs> kind of like put it right in the middle and spread. And I will, I used to make a, which makes it more complicated, so I don't do it anymore. But I used to make a um, cashew, cream, cashew cheese sauce that goes really good inside of this too. So you can get the idea. You can start switching this up. I mean, if you ate meat, you could put, somebody said I should put jerk shrimp in here. I was like, yeah, that might be good or chicken. So now I'm just shaving the carrot. And normally I would have all my veggies already shaved, but I didn't do any pre-prep work. So you're doing it with me. So normally I would shave all of my vegetables ahead and then I would have all my collard, green wrap, collard greens and then I would just roll all my wraps up. But we didn't do that today. And I'm putting a lot of carrots in here, I just realized, because <laughs> I'm talking. Um, but I like shaved vegetables because they add the texture. They give kind of like mimicking a meaty texture when they're shaved. OK, so now I'm doing this with a piece of chunk of the pepper. And let me cut off. I don't really like this part. But I can throw that in my stock when I get ready, when I get back to that. But I can take this. pepper, right? And then what else do I have? I have a cucumber. So 
So I'm gonna just cut the tip off of that. Now, again, I'm only making one of these right now for you all. So I'm gonna do this in a the way that I normally wouldn't, which is only shave off part of this cucumber. I don't want all of that skin because it makes it bitter. So I kind of take out that outer part or I could just honestly, most of the time I end up peeling it completely, but I'm gonna leave a little skin on there. Leave a little skin in the game on that one. I don't want the seeds, but once I get down to the seeds, I can peel all around this whole cucumber and then I can make cucumber water with the inner, um, just put it in the, a glass and pour some water over it and you've got cucumber water. I do wanna kinda like make these veggies kinda like crumpled up a little bit and see the, that's what the problem is with the skin. The skin makes it really stiff. If I didn't have the skin on this, it would really like, let me show you. It would really curl a lot better and easier. So there you go. Anyway. So cucumber, and I also love to add Napa cabbage to this because it gives a great crunch to it. We'll throw that piece of shard there. So I had some leftover Napa cabbage and I'm just gonna cut it really, really, really thin. I don't probably need more than that. Put that in. Now, I have a lot of veggies in there. So I like to have, you know, I need to have the right pesto to veggie um, ratio. <laughs> I feel like I put a lot of pesto in there, but I'm kind of worried, like, was that enough? So we'll see when I taste it and then I can just use it and smear some on as my dipping sauce if I would like. Um, oh, what else? I could put all kinds of other stuff on here, like chia seeds. I wanna add some more protein. I also, this is just stuff I pull out of my refrigerator when I'm making salads and stuff and like to just throw it on top. I could even throw, this is some hemp seeds. I usually keep hemp seeds, chia seeds, sunflower seeds. I keep all the seeds, all the seeds. I might even just go ahead and throw some sunflower seeds on here. Now it is in the pesto, but this is going to add to the texture when I crunch into the, now that's big, okay? <laughs> now I got to try to roll this. So I'm going to do that. I made it kind of chipotle technique. <laughs> yeah, and I, and then, I don't hold up the edges like chipotle because that would be a lot, but I do try to, it's kind of more like a sushi situation where you're kind of pulling it. Um, and now usually, you know, if I'm making a tray of these for catering, we would have little um, uh, toothpicks or little frill picks, right? And then if you're making a ton of these, it can get messy. So you have to like have something to wipe your knife off with, but I might, you know, cut the edge off. Now, when I cut the edges off, I just kind of like rough chop this and I'll make a little salad out of the, the edges, I just cut the edges off to make it clean looking so it doesn't look raggedy. Um, and so those spots are there. Um, and so there, we've got the row. I feel like it could be tighter. And so then, but it's looking good. Then I'm gonna cut it again here. In there, I'm gonna basically eat it at this point. Mm. Beautiful. Mm. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna say that. Looks mm -hmm. yummy. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, avocado would be yummy in there too. Mm -hmm. It really does not even need it. I had the perfect amount of pesto, but I have put avocado on these in the past. Great thing. More fat, good fat. Mm -hmm. It's but, a good way to also to make pesto too. So if you put the avocado in the bottom of the blender, mm -hmm. um, it blends up into basically a creamy sauce that starts to pull yep. those other vegetables down. So absolutely, you could actually do that more. So mm -hmm. use that, and then you don't have to put so much oil in it. The, the, the avocado will be the fat there. 
but yeah the oil this- is good for you right as long as it's a healthy like um non-industrial healthfully produced oil never be afraid of fat that is um naturally produced it's all the other crap you have to worry about <laughs> This is really good. I would forget how good this is. You're teasing us, Lachelle. My I was just rubbing it in. That's enough, <laughs> Lachelle. <laughs> Don't be my Facebook friend because people tell me they're tired of me because I'm always posting my food pictures and making them jealous. So it's well, just what I do, I guess. Well, you just showed us how to do it. So we have no excuse. Exactly. You got the recipes. This tastes like the cross between a really great fresh sandwich and a spring roll. I mean, it's got the pesto thing going on. Maybe the harissa too. And the harissa. Yeah, mm-hmm. I just got like a little spice thing going on back there. So, well, yeah, let's only have four or five mind. minutes left. So, yeah. just if there's anything else you want to um, bring up or talk about? Um, no, I um, I had fun with you guys. Um. Um, yes, I want to finish out. (laughs) Kind of a big bite there. And it is, you know, vegetables, so it takes some chewing. Anyway, so, um, I love making this dish. I'm going to spoon up the soup here in a second, but yeah, I really... One thing that we didn't, I guess, t- touch on, I love this conversation and the way that it just organically built, so I don't have any qualms about it. But, you know, we did talk a little bit about the um, a cultural appropriation topic last time. And I don't know that we even need to get into that here, but I always do like to talk about that when it comes to healing um, and history, right? Because in history, um, you know, colonization and kind of where we find ourselves now in the aftermath of that had everything to do with oppressing certain peoples and really taking um you know using them as a resource and you know that slavery and my ancestors that came out of slavery um you know that's something that I continue to dig in and learn more and research more and more about every day and what I'm learning is that and what I you know I've known that slaves weren't just taken for their physical labor for their knowledge right Um, and so, and for, you know, their knowledge of different systems, not just in general, like agriculture and botany and even medicine, right? And so what I've learned in some of my studies is that, you know, a lot of the foundations of what we know as modern medicine wouldn't be what it is today without slavery. And unfortunately, that was because of the, the subjugation of certain people using them, um, not only taking their healing knowledge, right? So African and indigenous peoples um, who use medicine practices were then used as healing practitioners, but also as test subjects. And so, um, and, and so what we now know, you know, uh, modern forms of many, you know, gynecology and things started with experimenting on black bodies. And so that's really important for me to point out because I talk a lot about healing and what we think of as modern medicine. And when we talk about appropriation and really understanding and connecting because all of this is connecting the healing, the food, the history, the stories. And so that's what I just like to kind of bring out and really, um, it's, it's a hard you know, history to talk about, but I like to get grounded in it um, because I like to celebrate the ingenuity that, that came out of that and, and kind of like what our opportunity to be empowered and grow and heal ourselves and our community and each other through food and through this knowledge. And so that's what I wanted to um, end with. And um, I got one minute if there's any questions or last minute things. Well, and I, I know that we, we actually owe Oh, um, a like we're compi- or compiling a newsletter uh, for questions that have come up over the last few classes, um, and I know, like the cultural appropriation. If you weren't a part of that, like that conversation we had during our last class, um, would love you to jump in. I know it's a it's a heavy topic without context, um, so it's I think it's an interesting one that we've been having around finding ways to appreciate culture while um, at the same time acknowledging like the broader history that comes along with 
how those came to be. And also between Jenny and Lachelle and I, we come from such different cultural backgrounds. So my, mo my mom is actually a West African immigrant. My dad's from Wisconsin. Um, uh, he's German by heritage, German and French by heritage. And then Jenny is Eastern European and Jewish. Uh, and then Lachelle's family, as she just mentioned, um, was part of or has history within the slave trade um, and the U.S. and and all of the all of the rich culture that comes comes out of that experience as well. So um, we are we are compiling a, a larger newsletter <laughs> to start to start to summon loop back on some of these more interesting heavier topics and also provide resources. And we're building also out a, a larger organization called Urban Wellbeing. Um, so that we can dive more deeply into these pieces. Um, so for those of you that weren't a part of those earlier conversations, um, we'd love for you to, to watch them and then uh, also jump in um, and send us questions uh, on things you're interested in that you would like to be a part of. Absolutely. And I just mentioned in the chat, folks, if you'd like to uh, sign up for class four and haven't yet, you certainly could do so. And I sent a link there. I'll also include that in the email when I send out the video recording of this class to you all. Awesome, so we do have classes, more um, Swan's class coming up. And then, can you guys see my screen now? I thought I was yep. sharing. Yeah, we can see you. Okay, cool, yeah, there's just, if you guys wanna know more about me, there's my website. You can follow me on Facebook or Instagram also. And then we have the upcoming classes Swans is in two weeks, and then we have our kind of culminating class um, at the end, which is two weeks after that. So I hope and look forward to seeing you all there. I also am offering my full series of Beyond Soul Food, which is a seven part series. The first three are already scheduled at Mississippi Market. It is free, so um, it's a great opportunity. <laughs> Um, if you're looking to delve more into these topics, I really dig deep in each one of those classes into kind of a lot of the things that we that I talked about today, different menus and recipes for each class. So you can check that out at msmarket.coop if you're interested or, you know, get in touch with us um, or me or however you want to do it. And then like Swan said, urban well-being and what we're creating will have more classes and more opportunities for learning and engaging with us so stay tuned and hopefully follow all of us i don't know jenny and swan you want to put how people just say really quick as we wrap up on um, how people can get in touch with you or sure um well the the evite um that mike sent out has all of our individual bios on there um so really quickly i know i know jenny had to jump off for um another class but you can get access to jenny um through through the evite uh and then really briefly I'm the only non-chef of the three instructors. Um, I'm actually a well-being coach. And then I also work in well-being tech. Um, so actually on like large software um, design and outreach uh, to make sure that I can broadly affect uh, communities um, when it comes to health. And Lachelle and I do some <laughs> well-being coaching on the side too, which is how we we uh, connected last summer. So happy you're all here. Um, I hope, hope you're able to, um, to join us for the rest of the class series. Yeah. Lachelle, thank you very much. Thank you. Swan and Jenny, thank you for chiming in. And we'll hope to see you all in a, in a couple of weeks. Take good awesome. care of yourself and each other.